So thanks, Alish, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm originally from Slovenia. It is nice to be uh, here for work for once. Um, but I do work in the UK, uh, specifically at Loughborough University. Um, I am going to talk about motor units and specifically what we do with them once we've decomposed the signals from EMG. Right. So it is going to be a bit of a sort of the last step of the pipeline that Alish is going to present now on Wednesday, I think. Um, so we, if there's some missing information, I don't mind being interrupted. I, I know you're on camera and everything, but uh, do try and interrupt me if, it, if it's not clear. Um, I also, like I said, I'll try to win the time back because it's one of those things we do in academia where I rejoiced last week when I was told that I've got two hours and then I probably made too many slides, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so in terms of the motor units, why we're interested in them is because they represent the final common pathway of activation signals. So the motor units are effectively the most fundamental property of the neuromuscular system. And what this structure does is it transforms the activation signal that converges on the alpha motor neuron and then transduces it into contractile activity via the muscle fibers. So they are very interesting to study because they can effectively predict movement. They can predict movement as well because of this high safety factor at the neuromuscular junction. So we have a one-to-one -one relation but in discharge timings between the motor neurons and the muscle fiber action potentials. And as such, they're also the only neural cell in humans that can be studied directly. So all the other cells typically we study indirectly in humans or the other neural cells, but the alpha motor neurons we can generally study directly. So when we decompose the, the surface EMG, and if we have good participants and low noise levels and so on, um, we can get to quite a reasonably large representative population of, of motor units that are discharging. Typically, we do that in isometric settings. That is the constraint we're currently operating with. We are trying to move to more dynamic movements, but I would say for now, the vast majority of the literature will be uh, derived from isometric contractions. So what do the motor units do? How do they control muscle force at a very basic level? What they do, um, how they control muscle force is by recruiting new motor units and then by discharging them at certain rates. So the discharge rates will increase, obviously, if we, we increase the contraction force. Um, and it will slightly the strategy that uh, a given motor pool does that differs slightly. Um, it usually differs depending on the innovation ratio. So hand muscles, such as the first also interosseous, which is the muscle here on your hand uh, that adducts the index finger, typically relies more on discharge rate than recruitment. Partly this is because it recruits the entirety of the motor pool at fairly low force levels. So at 50% of the maximum force, all the motor units are recruited in a motor pool and then it needs to rely exclusively on discharge rate to keep increasing force. And more sort of proximal muscles that are involved in gross motor production. So a deltoid here as an example, you can see that the charge rate modulation is quite poor. So they do rely on recruiting new units to keep increasing force. And, and I will come back to that uh, eventually, but it's important to know that the, depending on the pool that you're investigating, if it's a more proximal muscle or it's, if it's a typically a muscle that is involved in gross movement production, so most of the leg muscles will be like that. They are relying more on recruitment because it is more efficient. So the resolution with which you can achieve the control of force will be poorer with this, but you will be able to achieve higher forces more efficiently. If you want higher resolutions, such as with fine motor control actions of the, of the hand, you will be required to um, rely on the charge rate principally because of the higher resolution in force control that offers. So what I want to cover today in the first part is what are the considerations when quantifying the charge rate during voluntary contractions, and particularly most of this will be in isometric settings, and then how different types of inputs have an effect of mo on motor unit discharge behavior, um, and then how this discharge behavior tends to differ in different experimental conditions in different populations. So I'll show some examples from my lab of, of studying different populations and sort of the adaptation in the neuromuscular system that we can see with that. So 
the, the first thing to mention when it comes to investigating discharge rate is that um, there will be some bearing onto the recruitment threshold of a unit. Right? So you here have an example of three different muscles that are producing forces of different levels between 30 and 70 percent of maximum. And these are ensemble averages, so they're population averages from, from the, the entirety of the sample that we've got, and they bend into um, motor units of, of roughly a, a given threshold that's in a, a 7% bend. So the, these, the ones that are in red here, these patterns that you see, those, those are all the units that had a recruitment threshold between 0 and 7% maximum and so on. And as you can see here, that there is some relation to how the units behave depending on the threshold. Uh, so at low intensity contractions, typically the units that were recruited first tend to achieve the highest discharge rate. We refer to this phenomenon as the onion skin as well. It doesn't happen exclusively, but in humans we do see it quite regularly. Okay, This is in contrast to most of the animal work that's been done, particularly in the 70s, 80s and so on, where, where the, the higher threshold units uh, tend to produce the highest firing rates. Why that is? It's a lot of debate in the literature and a lot of potential explanations. Uh, don't necessarily have time today to go into that. But the point about it is that the recruitment threshold will to some degree predict the discharge rate. As such, if we do typically, at least in my lab, and I think everyone should do this, when we are using statistical models then to quantify discharge behavior, we are using a recruitment threshold as a covariate. So this, in this particular example, a, a typical mixed model that we would use in statistics with discharge rate as the outcome variable, with fixed factors of contraction strength and, and muscle in this case, we would then use recruitment threshold as a covariate. The other reason that we need to use the recruitment threshold as a covariate is that we have biases in our decomposition. So it's a shame that Alish wasn't here before me, but typically the, the blind source separation algorithms will have a bias towards decomposing or identifying higher threshold units. So in a, in a given contraction, let's say it's a 20% contraction, you're more likely to, to identify units that are of higher threshold within that contraction. Okay, So that sampling bias that you will have will then affect your discharge rate estimation on the population level and therefore using recruitment thresholds as a covariate is a good idea. So if we do it here, we've got an example of two units, right? And the in typical contractions, trapezoidal contractions, where we have an individual contract with a certain force level, we would then typically just quantify the discharge rate at this plateau region. But if you just look very closely now in the, at the smoother firing, what you see is that it's not particularly stable, so there's some noise in there, some variability, which is normal. But also, if I was to choose this epoch here, I would have a certain value of discharge rate. If I then increase the length of this epoch, I would have a different discharge rate again, and again, and again. And you can see here, so I quantify this, if I just took the first five seconds, the first 10 seconds, or the first 15 seconds, you can see that the average discharge rate here is dropping, okay? And you can observe that here as well. There is a slight decline, okay? So why does this happen? There's a phenomenon called spike frequency adaptation. So every neural cell, if after a, if there's a prolonged synaptic input to which the cell is responding, that the cell will adapt to that synaptic input, basically, and will stop discharging at the same frequency, it will reduce its firing, okay? So that's something to take into account when you're doing it, when you're trying to quantify discharge rate, particularly if you've got fairly long contractions, okay? Um, the problem is that this phenomenon will not be equal across people. It will not be equal across units with a certain firing, uh, certain recruitment threshold. So it's something to keep in mind when you are quantifying this charge, right? Okay. It's not to say that you cannot do it like this. It's just to say that this is a potential compound. And indeed, if we have very long contractions, so here we've got a 20 seconds of a contraction. If we extend it even longer and a new unit is recruited, we can see that there's a, a sort of decline in discharge rate that we observe here. And then if we extend it even longer, what happens is that the discharge rate starts increasing again. So this is an example of a contraction performed to failure. 
Okay, so this is a 20% contraction. Individual was tasked to just keep holding that contraction until they can't anymore. Um, and what you do observe is this biphasic behavior when you have an initial decrease caused by spike frequency adaptation, and then you have a, a, an increase until task failure. You also see that new units are being recruited um, because the force level, the force producing capacity of the muscle decreases um, as we are fatiguing. And the motor pool uses two different strategies. So one is recruitment of additional motor units that weren't recruited initially during submaximal tasks such as this one. Um, and eventually that's not sufficient to maintain the force level uh, that the person was tasked to, to perform. And we are recruiting new units at that point. Uh, sorry, increasing discharge rate in addition to recruiting new units. Okay. When quantifying discharge rate here, it is rather challenging. So what we need to do is, is separate this stuff into, into a given set of epochs. What we also need to do, and this is related more to decomposition of the signals, we cannot just decompose the entirety of the signal that's long, so that the signal that I showed you on the, on the previous, the task that I showed you on the previous slide was about, I think it was about 200 seconds long. If we just decompose that, we wouldn't find um, a lot of units or any units for that matter. The reason for that is that you have changes happening at the level of the periphery, which cause changes in waveform shapes, motor unit action potential waveform shapes, which are, um, which then means that the algorithm is incapable of identifying that unit as the same unit. It would effectively mean it thinks it's a different unit, put simply. Okay. So what we did in this study basically is we decomposed a, a section, a 30 second section in, in, at the end and in the beginning, and um, because that was a 30 seconds was sort of a period when we we had a relative certainty that the action potential waveform will not have changed in that period. OK, um, then we tracked units basically in, in overlapping windows, as you can see here. So we decompose the original signal, we get the spike trains and then we're, we're slowly moving um, if we start from here, we're slowly moving in 15 second overlapping windows towards the beginning of the task and vice versa. It is a painful process. <clears throat> I generally don't recommend these studies for analysis reasons. Um, and, and the student uh, in my lab that was doing this can attest to this probably. But what you do find is something very interesting. What you do find is that <clears throat> if you perform a sustained task, so that's the task at the, at the top there, um, where you ask an individual to contract for as long as they can at 20 percent of maximal force. Uh, the force producing capacity of the muscle drops. So this is the maximal contractions performed before and, and after. Um, and what you can see here is this biphasic behavior that I showed you previously. OK, and that happens in both vastus lateralis and medialis in this case. OK, what's interesting as well, and I don't have the slide to show this, but I generally we have a relative predictive power of this inversion point or inflection point where there's a reversal from a, a decrease in discharge rate into an increase that we have quite a good predictive power of of, um, of time to task failure okay that's been shown previously i should say but we weren't the first ones to show this but we, but we were the first ones to show though was that if we perform an intermittent task so we're effectively asking participants to repetitively perform ramp contractions to 50% of maximum voluntary force, which causes roughly the same decrease in maximum force generating capacity as the 20% task that's sustained. Um, what we do see is a slight difference in behavior. So we don't generally see that spike frequency adaptation in the beginning, but we do eventually see an increase towards the end. And again, if we calculate this inflection point, we have relatively good predictive power of time to task failure. But the point about this is just that depending on the condition that you're in, you will have, when you're trying to quantify discharge, right, <clears throat> you will have certain constraints, you will have certain things that affect it, and it's important that you are when you are quantifying the discharge, right, that you're doing that in the constraints that you're operating in. So in this case, what we did, we had to separate effectively the, 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 the entirety of the task in 10% bins, <clears throat> so because people will have lasted. For, for different durations, right? So if you ask any of you here to perform these same tasks, not everyone will last for the same amount of time. So we had to split it in 10% in bins to be able to 
quantify this in a, in a just and comparable way, basically. Things change even more if we have a, a condition where um, we are varying input, right? So in this case, you have a contraction where you're just increasing input and decreasing it. You aren't sort of sustaining input at any point into the cell. And you can see here example of two uh, motor units behaving in a certain way. And what you can probably notice is that despite the fact that the force trace was linearly increasing and decreasing, the discharge rate wasn't doing the same thing, right? It's not just linearly increasing and decreasing. And particularly, I'll just highlight one section here. So if you look at this section that I've highlighted here in particular, you can see that the force is increasing, but the discharge rate is effectively staying flat, right? It's saturated completely. It's probably slightly less saturated here in this example than in this one. I purposely picked two units that have roughly the same recruitment threshold to make the comparison fair. And we do see slight subtle differences, but the, the important point is that the firing rate has saturated, okay? The other thing that you probably see is that the, the time at recruitment or the force at which the unit was recruited, when you move along to the other side, when the force was decreasing, that unit is not de-recruiting at the same time, right? So it has, a sort of hysteresis that you see here um, that suggests that something might be happening. Okay. The reason why these things might be happening is that motor units are transformers of all the synaptic inputs that they receive. And in addition to that, motor neurons are not a passive conducting cell. Okay. They don't just passively conduct the input that they get, They're, they have active properties when transforming that input. Okay. Roughly speaking, we have three types of inputs. We have the typical excitatory input, most of which originates from higher order brain centers. So the, the classic inputs of the motor neuron would be something like a corticospinal input from, from the primary motor cortex, reticular spinal input from, from the brain stem, um, to some extent rubrospinal input, although in humans it has a, a less relevance. Um, we have also quite a large network of inhibitory inputs, both from supraspinal centers, as well as an extensive spinal network of inhibitory inputs. But that's not, that would still make it a passive cell, just if those inputs existed. The, the important input that makes it an active cell is the so-called neuromodulatory input. So it's an input originating from the brainstem that's predicated on the release of serotonin and noradrenaline as the neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters attach to something called a G-protein coupled receptors on motor neuron dendrites and facilitate the so-called persistent inward currents. Okay? It's important, this last bit is the one thing that's important to remember, are the persistent inward currents. They are located on the dendrites of a motor neuron. And what they do is that they introduce non-linearities in motor neuron firing, okay? So if we didn't have monominergic inputs, so serotonin, noradrenaline, and, and generation of persistent inward currents, what we would typically see is a discharge of a motor neuron that would be approximately linearly related to the excitatory synaptic input or force in the case of humans. So this is an example of a cat motor neuron where you can do a current injection that's perfectly linear. And if there was no monomins, no monominergic system, you would see a complete, basically, matching of input-output relationship. But when we do have monomins, we have this behavior that's non-linearly related to the excitatory synaptic input. So what we do get is an initial acceleration then a post-acceleration attenuation or saturation of firing, and ultimately a prolongation that you can see here, okay? Which results in this hysteresis that I showed you previously, okay? What is interesting is that this, this non-linearity allows us to estimate quite a lot of cellular properties of motor neurons, even in a human, just from, from discharge pattern that we observe here. The important thing to understand about persistent inward currents of PACs is that they effectively amplify and prolong the synaptic input. 
And this allows for a fairly efficient structure in the neuromuscular system for force production. And probably if we didn't have them, our force producing capacity would be reduced quite substantially, even up to 50% less force we, we would typically produce. So the, the first I'll focus on two things. So one is the amplification of firing. The other one is the prolongation of firing. Um, so the first I'll focus on prolongation or self-sustained firing. So this is a, um, a hyperpolarized neuron in a cat. Um, and you can see that even when we, we remove the synaptic input here, the unit still is, exhibits so-called self-sustained firing. So that's quite efficient, right? You don't need to feed synaptic input into a cell constantly for that cell to keep discharging. It would be quite inefficient to do so. And that would be the case if neurons were solely passive conductors of synaptic input. And indeed, it took quite a while to discover this, partly because most of the, the work on motor neuron cell, particularly in sort of like the 60s, 70s, was done in anesthetized cats. So if you anesthetize someone, you don't have the effect of brainstem neuromodulation or motor neuron output, right? You just kill it dead, basically. And then you think your neuron, motor neuron is a passive cell, when in fact it is very much an active cell, as this demonstrates here. And indeed, if we, if we feed a varying synaptic input, and so a current injection into a spinal cord of a cat, you, you see this behavior. And indeed, in a human, if we ask someone to perform force in a, in a triangle varying way, we do see very similar behavior to here, okay? So you can see that both exhibit initial acceleration, they both exhibit some saturation, and they both exhibit prolongation, which results in hysteresis. Now, this hysteresis is particularly interesting because it's quite relatively easy to quantify. It seems now, but it took a while to come up with. So Monica Gurusini in the late 90s, early 2000s, came up with, a, with an approach quantification approach to this hysteresis, okay? So what we do in this case, we take a pair of units, we take a pair of motor units that supposedly share a large proportion of the common synaptic input. And then what we estimate is how much the, so we call this unit here a control unit or a reporter unit, and we call it this higher threshold unit a test unit, okay? So what we do is we calculate this charge rate at test unit of the control unit, a test unit recruitment, and then we calculate the discharge rate of the control unit at test unit D recruitment. Okay. The difference between them is the difference in frequency of discharge, or so-called delta F, and that allows us to estimate the contribution of persistent inward currents to self-sustained firing. Okay. What we need to do effectively to do this, we first need to smooth the discharge behavior that we observe. This is to have an estimate of synaptic input. We, in the literature, we've, there's many different methods of smoothing discharge rate that have been proposed. Um, most originally, it was done with polynomial fit functions. Um, the problem with them, though, is that they tend to, so if you, if you look at here, you have a polynomial function. What they tend to do is they tend to miss where the first firing has occurred and they tend to overly smooth the discharge rate that you're observing. Um, you'll probably be, if, you're, if you are in this field of, of um, EMG decomposition and trying to understand the discharge behavior, you might be familiar with something like a Han window. Um, it's also, it's probably slightly better in some respects, but not so much in others. Currently, what we use in my lab and um, th that's been developed by um, CJ Heckman's lab in Chicago is the support vector regression um, because it's just been demonstrated to lead to the least fit error. Um, so we first do that, okay? We first smooth the discharge rate. The other thing that we need to do is we need to find a suitable pair. Not all pairs of motor units that you are decomposing, that you're observing, are a suitable pair, okay? We need to meet certain assumptions for a pair to be valid, for us to have a valid estimator of the persistent inward current. Um, so the first thing to, to appreciate is that we're trying to find units that share a high proportion of common synaptic input. To do that, we calculate the so-called rate-rate correlation, and they should have a, an R squared greater than 0.7. Um, this has some reassurance that these two pairs of units have received the same common synaptic input. 
We also need to have sufficient recruitment time difference between them. This is because persistent with currents are, uh, in absolute sense, a relatively slow property. Okay, so they take between half a second to two seconds for persistent with currents to be fully activated. Um, so we generally ensure that the time spacing between the recruitment of these two units is at least one second. And then we want to ensure that the, the control unit is not completely saturated so that it achieves at least some discharge rate modulation of at least 0.5 pulses per second. Um, it's not very common for it not to do that, I would say, though. Um, the other thing that can affect it is the modulation and discharge rate that you're uh, recording the, of the task that you, you're doing. So you can see here an example from a paper that the peak discharge rate of a given unit will, will correlate quite highly with um, the so-called delta F. I personally don't think that's problematic because it's, the, it's this that's driving discharge rate behavior. But if you wanted to understand intrinsically what's happening with this metric, rather than focusing just on peak discharge rate, the, the main thing to focus on is on the descending discharge rate modulation because that's the thing that's ingrained in the calculation of the metric. So we've come up with this so-called uh, normalization technique that accounts for the possibility that if this test unit kept discharging and was de-recruited at the same time as a control unit, that would be the maximal possible change in frequency of these two pairs. Um, so we normalize it to that. But generally, this is quite a rare occasion where you do need to use that. So what I've spoken about now is the prolongation of discharge, right? So that's one of the property of persistent inward currents on, on motor neuron discharge. Uh, so at least this is the recess that I talked about. But there's the other side of the, the coin, which is the amplification or acceleration of, of motor neuron discharge. Um, and even in this section, as you can see, it's highly nonlinear relative to the synaptic excitatory synaptic input. So we can quantify the extent to which it is nonlinear um, by with a geometric approach. Um, basically, so what we do here is we express the change in discharge rate as a function of a change in force. Uh, we do this because humans aren't perfect at producing force. We're not in a cat model where we can inject current into the spinal cord of a cat that's perfectly linear. So we do need to express this as a change in force. And then what we calculate here is the maximal orthogonal vector from this linear line between onset of discharge rate and peak discharge. Okay. In simple terms, this just tells us the extent to which discharge behavior is nonlinear relative to force. Okay. We're using force in these examples as an estimate of the excitatory synaptic input because that's all we've got. We don't have accessibility to understand what sort of input has come into the cell, um, but we can estimate it from the trajectory of force that we're trying to produce. We are typically normalizing this to, to the so-called right triangle just because if you are producing forces that are greater or smaller, discharge rate modulation will be greater or smaller, which can uh, confound this measure. Um, so what we do here is, again, this is the same unit that was discharging like this. What we do is we imagine what would be the, the PAC activation that would be maximal. So you would have perfect acceleration and then perfect saturation, basically. Um, and the, the extent of that nonlinearity is at 100%. We express the height of this to the height of that, and we get a proportion of the right triangle in this case. So these are the two metrics, basically, with which we can estimate the contribution of PACs. What's important to understand about PACs is that they have as I explained, uh, a large contribution from metabotropic inputs from the brainstem. So serotonin is being constantly released and it's affecting the discharge, right? But that system is quite diffuse, right? So if that system was operational to its full capacity without any constraints, we'd struggle to walk, we'd struggle to control movement because all units would constantly be recruited, okay? It wouldn't be very good. So what we do have, on the other hand, is the local inhibitory inputs that can downregulate the activity of PACs and allow us to behave in the real world the way we do every day, allow us to walk, uh, allow us to manipulate objects and so on. So these two systems, 
that we've got will differently affect different aspects of the motor neuron discharge. And you can see here in simulations that when you have a delta F that I showed in the previous slide, you can see that it's here what they were doing, they were changing neuromodulation in the system. And you can see that it's relatively proportional to neuromodulation. So when you have more serotonin in simple terms, you have higher delta F in general. But the other thing that, it, that is affected by as well is the extent or the pattern of inhibition, right? So here they tested three different inhibition patterns, one that would be reciprocal relative to excitatory input. So when excitatory input is increasing, the inhibitory pattern is decreasing. One where it would be tonic for constant, and one where it would be proportionally increasing with excitation. And you can see the delta F is also changing depending on the inhibitory pattern that we're using in, in these simulations. On the other hand, this brace height or the extent of nonlinearity, regardless of the inhibitory pattern, is staying quite sort of the same. The only thing that seems to be um, influencing it is the extent of neuromodulation. So what these metrics allow us to do effectively is to separate two different types of inputs, inhibitory inputs and neuromodulation from the brainstem. Okay. So I'll show you here an example of what we did with, with just looking at different contraction force levels. Uh, so we had three different muscles, tibialis anterior at the top there, vastus lateralis and medialis, and we, we recorded signals during 30, 50, and 70% of maximal isometric force. Um, I will show you here data where, where motor units are tracked across different contraction levels, but we actually didn't find they had any influence of whether we track the same units or not, as long as we use the recruitment threshold as a covariate in our statistical models. Um, and we use these metrics here, and you can see here an example. You can probably already observe that some of these metrics are slightly different when you're increasing contraction force. Contraction force here being an estimator of excitatory synaptic input. So in, at 70%, obviously, the excitatory synaptic input will have to be much greater. So what we did see, obviously, discharge rate was increasing. This is what you would expect. Um, and concomitantly with that, what we did see as well is that delta F, or prolongation of discharge rate, was increasing as well. What was interesting, though, is that on the ascending limb, so when we looked at the extent of nonlinearity, the firing rates tended to become more linear as the force level was increasing. Okay. So this gave us a pause a bit for a second because we were <clears throat> were thinking, okay, how, how could we explain this? How could we interpret this stuff? And we had a bit of a confound here in that we were increasing force level for 10 seconds up and 10 seconds down, regardless of the, the target, the peak force level. <clears throat> and um, that represents a confound insofar as that the rate of force increase is different then, okay? So the rate of force increase will be the slowest here and it will get progressively faster as, you, as you're going up in, in intensity uh, if you have a fixed time period, right? So we repeated the experiment this time just with tibialis anterior and we repeated the, uh, the experiment whereby we had two conditions, so there were duration, so-called duration match contractions, so there were 10 seconds up and down, or there were rate match contractions, so where the rate of force increase was 5% MVC per second. Um, and what we did find that even if we did that, we still get the same results. Maybe the, the, the results aren't as strong, or the effect sizes of the differences aren't as strong, depending on the condition, but the general patterns are the same, whereby the prolongation of discharge rate increases, and the, the extent of nonlinearity decreases. So just to sum that up of what our interpretation is at the moment, and we are still working on this, but our interpretation is that as you are increasing the excitatory synaptic input, you're either increasing the rate or the strength of the excitatory synaptic input, the relative contribution of PICs will be decreasing. The reason for that is that, as you can see here on the figure, the Persistent inward currents have a relatively slow activation time. I'm talking relatively because it still happens within a second or so. And in conditions of very high synaptic input or high rate of synaptic input, you effectively override the relative contribution of PSEs. 
that will result in more linear firing um, and ultimately will still lead to greater prolongation because the PACs in simple terms have a chance to catch up basically and they'll still lead to to very prolonged firing when the force is greater okay there's some other metrics that are particularly sensitive to inhibition so earlier I talked about the potential to dissociate inhibitory inputs on the motor neuron from the neuromodulatory inputs by looking at brace height or the extent of nonlinearity and looking at delta F or hysteresis of firing. But actually, in the preliminary simulations with a, that were based on a single force level, what they tended to find is that this attenuation period or saturation period, the slope, is quite highly predictive of inhibition. So you can see here when neuromodulation changes, the attenuation slope tends to not change, but when you are increasing or changing inhibition pattern, you do see a change in the extent or the slope of attenuation slope with motor neuron discharge. The problem with that when you are increasing force is that the, uh, sorry, one thing before I go on to that, we have recently demonstrated that as well in, a, in a, an experiment by one of my undergraduate students. We effectively took a, a, a cuff um, around the knee, um, inflated that cuff for about 20 minutes or so, waiting for the H reflex response to decrease or be completely abolished. So that's how we knew that the one afferent input had been abolished or had an influence motor neuron discharge rate, which will increase, um, or sorry, decrease acutely reciprocal inhibition. And what you do see here is that before you do that, you have a, a relatively normal discharge pattern here, but the discharge pattern becomes much more saturated, right? So when you're changing inhibition, you are changing your discharge pattern here, okay? So at the single force level, this works very well. It's attenuation slope is quite a good predictor of changing inhibition, but the problem arises when you're trying to do that at when you're changing contraction force. So th this is from my data that I showed you previously. So you see the, the, the full lines at the ascending discharge, the uh, dashed lines at the descending discharge. And you can see that as you're going up in intensity, the slopes tend to become more flat, basically. The reason for that is that because we're expressing this as a, as a change of uh, force level, the relative change in force level will always be greater than the relative change in discharge rate, okay? So you can see here, this is trying to model in a very simple way from our data, the change in discharge rate at 30%, 50%, and 70% if the PACs were activated perfectly and maximally. So they will have perfect acceleration and then perfect saturation. And you can see that no matter how we do it, if we are increasing force, we'll see a, a decline or, or decrease in steepness of the acceleration or attenuation slope. So we can't necessarily infer anything about inhibition in these conditions. We can only do it when the force is the same and when the experimental conditions are such that they're not changing in terms of the force level. Um, but we can do it with simulations. So this is a, a motor neuron model that was developed by uh, originally by Randy Powers and CJ Heckman in the US. We've uh, in collaboration with Drew Bouchamp, we've adopted that model now. So very basically what we do with this, we, we set the input to the motor neuron pool uh, that sets the initial motor neuron pool output. Then we compare that motor neuron pool output to a reference value. Reference value is the cumulative spike train from our own data, basically. Okay, so we record the data, we put it in as a reference, and we run many iterations of this model to generate firing patterns with the least fit error to a reference point. That's all you need to know, basically. It's a realistic motor neural model that has a specific set of inputs, a lot of cellular properties, mostly based on the working cat, just because it's compromised, just because we cannot um, investigate those cellular properties in humans necessarily. So what we did model was different types of inhibitory patterns. So either a strong reciprocal pattern, uh, as you can see here, a mild reciprocal pattern and a proportional pattern. And what we get 
uh, the discharge patterns that look sort of like this. They're very similar to the ones that we can obtain experimentally. And no matter what we do, um, we tend to see uh, a sort of rep we tend to replicate our own data, whereby the charge rates become more linear with increased in force level if the pattern is reciprocal. Okay, so it suggests that if normal contractions in a healthy human, we do have a tendency to see a reciprocal pattern of incubation relative to excitation. It is quite logical if you think about it. It wouldn't be very evolutionary sensible to be increasing inhibitory input as you're trying to increase excitation. Okay. There might be some conditions, and we are exploring this in certain pathological conditions in particular, where this may not be the case, or certainly where the pattern is less reciprocal, right? So you can have a very highly reciprocal pattern, and then you can have a pattern that's technically still reciprocal, but isn't to the same extent reciprocal, okay? But generally, we are replicating this, our data, with a very reciprocal pattern of incubation. Where the source of that inhibition is, we don't know necessarily. Um, the persistent interference are, for example, very sensitive to something like uh, reciprocal inhibition. So by that, I mean the, the 1A afferent uh, inhibitory interneuron inhibition, or something like erential cell inhibition would be quite potent to modulate uh, PACs very likely just because of the, the, the strong effects they tend to have on the motor neuron and its location and locality to where the, the PACs are located on the dendrites. Very quickly, before we move on to a break, I'll show you some examples of how we can use these metrics to, to try to get a sense of how adaptation or alteration of the neuromuscular system tends to work. So here we've got an example of, of three different groups. We've got resistance trained individuals that have a tendency to produce higher forces. And indeed, if you look at this, they do have a tendency to produce higher forces. We've got a group of untrained individuals and a group of chronically endurance trained individuals. This is a cross-sectional comparison. It is an, uh, a training study. Just to take a note. And we basically repeated our init initial experiment. And what we did find was importantly that the differences in discharge rates between resistant trained and in this case untrained were only visible at very high contraction forces. So only visible at 70%. Um, we didn't see any difference in discharge rate hysteresis or delta F. But what we did see was that the linearity of discharge rate was very different between the groups. So chronically trained individuals, regardless of whether they were resistance trained or endurance trained, tend to produce the same force levels with a much more linear discharge pattern at high force levels. Okay. Um, and even if we look at the attenuation slope here, we see differences just at high force levels. Using attenuation slope here is a fair comparison. The reason for that is that we are comparing it just within a, a given force level. So we can't compare it across force levels, but we can compare it within a given force level. Okay. So if I return back to, to the similar image, everything else that I said previously still works. So the charge patterns become more linear, or the ascending discharge pattern becomes more linear regardless of the group but it becomes slightly more linear in, um, in trained individuals. And because of the differences in attenuation slope, we suggest that that might be because of differences in inhibitory pattern. So the trained individuals tend to have more reciprocal inhibitory patterns, okay? Because of that, they're able to linearize motor unit discharge to a greater extent and possibly reach greater discharge rates and ultimately reach greater force levels. It does have some logic to it, particularly from the, the evolutionary side of things. If we flip the coin a bit, so we had an example of a population that has augmented force levels. Now we've got a, we'll be looking at a population that has attenuated force levels. So those are the, the, um, the aging individuals. So as we age, we tend to, there's a number of alterations that, that happen in the neuromuscular system um, that ultimately lead to the reduction in maximum force producing capacity, obviously. You will know that in general, there's a number of other alterations, but we'll be focusing on force producing capacity in the first instance here. Um, so this is a simple cross-sectional comparison by one of my PhD students. Um, 
And we indeed see that even in a dorsiflexor, a muscle that's relatively preserved in aging, particularly if you compare it to more proximal muscles such as knee extensors, the dorsiflexors tend to be more preserved. We still see a subtle difference in strength. Um, and we do see a difference in discharge rate between young and older, sort of what you would expect. Um, what perhaps we didn't expect was that the, the extent to the difference would be sort of the same at all force levels. Well, if we look at the other metrics that I presented today, what you see is that in younger individuals, delta F or discharge rate hysteresis was increasing as the force level was increasing. So this is similar to what I've shown you pre on previous slides, right? I keep showing you here that we can replicate this in different populations. However, in older individuals, what we do see is a relative unmodulation of discharge rate hysteresis, right? So you can see here that the prolongation of discharge rate didn't seem to happen, to nowhere near to the same extent. In fact, we saw a subtle difference here, statistical difference here between 30 and 50 percent, but no differences between 50 and 70 percent. What's interesting is that with brace height or the extent of nonlinearity is exactly the same in both groups. And if I remind you from before, this metric here is sensitive to both neuromodulation and inhibition. This metric here is exclusively sensitive to neuromodulation. So what we can conclude in this case, or what we're suggesting at least, is that these differences that we're seeing here in older adults are probably due to differences in inhibitory patterns that happen. There's some support from cellular research, from molecular research, that the relative how to put it, relative number of synapses in the motor neuron dendrites shift toward the, the inhibitory synapses. So you are losing synapses as you're, you're getting older, and, and you seem to retain a lot more inhibitory synapses than excitatory synapses, which will support this in general. Um, but hopefully I've given you a flavor for this. If I just recap before we move on to, to a break. In the first bit, I showed you that it's really important when you're trying to quantify the charge rate, they do this to the lens of the experimental context or the conditions or the population that you're studying. Be mindful of selecting the epoch in which you're calculating your discharge rate. It's not to say that you can't calculate it in a longer epoch. It's just to say that something like spike frequency adaptation will probably influence your result. Um, and recruitment threshold is a likely covariate. So please, I would recommend strongly that you do use in your statistical models, particularly if you're using mixed models for your stats, they use recruitment threshold as a covariate when quantifying metrics related to discharge rate modulation. Most importantly, and hopefully some, for some of you this will be new today, is that motor unit discharge rate is non-linearly related to excitation. So input output of the motor neuron is not linear. It's not, motor neuron is not a passive cell. It's not a passive conductor of excitatory input. It is an active cell. Um, and that's, we can then quantify that to get a sense of a number of different inputs. Um, what I've shown you in the first slide is uh, an example of a condition such as this. So in typical isometric contractions, we perform them relatively slowly. We do them in a sustained manner. And what we get is a, relative, a condition where firing is relatively asynchronous, okay? What I'll focus on now is two examples where firing is much more synchronous and or the recruitment range is, is very compressed. The two of these examples are evoked contractions, so they're contractions that are evoked by an external stimulus. So that could be a magnetic stimulation of the cortex, it could be the stimulation, electrical stimulation of, of uh, peripheral nerve, for example. And the other one is a condition when we perform contractions as rapidly as possible. So when we go from a resting state to very high force, usually sort of quite high metric force in the space of a few hundred milliseconds. Okay, so I will come to why understanding this is important. The first bit I'll focus on are the evoked contractions um, and specifically how we can even identify. So I will switch from physiology slightly to decomposition now. Um, I will tell you about the bits of decomposition that are relevant for this. You will get the, the entirety of the pipeline explained by Alash on Wednesday anyway. But how can we even identify those things in the first place? Um, and then some challenges in, in estimating recruitment thresholds um, in conditions of a compressed 
motor unit recruitment brain. So in both of those conditions of evoked contractions and rapid contractions, we have a very compressed recruitment range. And there's some challenges in how we can estimate recruitment threshold. And then how we quantify the charge rate behavior during voluntary rapid contractions and or maximal efforts, so maximal contractions in general. Um, so just a note on decomposition. So we, I'll use a slightly different analogy than normal, but when we have a multi-channel EMG um, and we're trying to decompose that with blind source separation algorithms, it would be the equivalent of people watching football, a large group of people watching football and just talking amongst yourselves. Not shouting necessarily, but just having a conversation about watching football. It's quite apt around this time, particularly with Euros going on. And in order to distinguish your voices, we need to set a large number of microphones in the room. And that way, when we have a lot of microphones, we can identify the independent sources, which are your voices. Okay, we can distinguish everyone has a slightly different characteristics to their voice, and that's how we can distinguish them. That's how multi-channel EMG decomposition works. So we have a large number of channels, we have high density of channels, and we're able to identify the sources because we have a lot of microphones, essentially. In the cases of evoked contractions, we have a condition where a goal is scored and everyone shouts at the same time. Right? So very difficult, despite having a large number of microphones in the room, it's very difficult to distinguish the voices because everyone's shouting at the same time. Okay. So that's the problem that we've got when trying to identify units. The important thing to understand very briefly here is that prime source separation algorithms um, have the, the main principle behind them is that they invert the EMG mixing models, right? So instead of focusing on waveforms, what they focus on is the initiation of separation vectors or motor unit filters, okay? So by estimating or calculating separation vectors, we can then estimate the spike strain, and that's how we get to individual motor unit. Motor unit filters or separation vectors are basically a set of weights in the spatial and temporal domain that represent the motor unit waveform on the, the grid of the EMG channels. So most of you will be familiar, perhaps you're familiar with this as well, but most of you will certainly be familiar if you work with EMG with a number of spatial filters. So if you, the, the classic recording is monopolar, we can't really distinguish anything from that, okay? We have a single weight in a grid and we can't even distinguish anything. If we add a number of weights in spatial domains, something our calculation filter or a classic bipolar recording that has two weights, we can start to sort of see something happening. If we then extend the number of weights in the spatial domain, we're starting to increase the sparsity in the signal, and we increase the number of weights in the temporal domain, then we see very high degree of sparsity here, and we can distinguish the motor unit firings from noise or crosstalk from other units. Just on a basic level, this is what we can do. This is how we get to individual motor unit spike trains. When a motor unit spike train has been estimated or motor unit uh, filter initiated, we can then apply, we can estimate it from one contraction and apply it to another one and identify the same units without decomposing this signal per se. Okay. So that's an important notion to understand because this is exactly how we approach this. So if I return back to my analogy here, we estimate the filters that underlie the sources in this condition and then apply them to a condition when everyone's shouting at the same time. This is an evolved contraction, okay? So that's exactly what we did. This, is, um, this was originally done on the, the H reflexes, um, but the point is the same because we're not in simulations, we're not actually um, simulating H reflexes per se, we're just simulating an evolved response. Um, so we had a set of voluntary contractions um, simulated here. So these are synthetic EMG signals. We decompose them as if they were experimental signals. We estimate the motor unit filters and we apply them to this condition um, of evoked contractions. And these evoked contractions were, were set to uh, recruit 50% of the entirety of the motor pool. And we simulated different synchronization levels here. These synchronization levels, most of them will be suffer physiological. So, that the sort of synchronization level, which is set here by the standard deviation of latency of firings, uh, will be sort of between just below one millisecond to sort of 1.5 milliseconds or so, roughly, is what we tend to get. So if we look at this plot now, 
what we do tend to see is that the precision is generally of units that we do identify is generally very high. Um, but what it's important to note here is that we do have very low number of false negatives. So because we were simulating um, the evoked responses to recruit 50% of the multiple, you can see here that we weren't identifying any units that had a recruitment threshold of 50%. Okay, so that was quite good news. We had high levels of precision throughout, so you can see here it's in the sort of 90% or above, um, but comparatively, the sensitivity was fairly, uh, relatively lower. This indicates that some firings might be missed when you are transferring the filter from voluntary contractions onto evoked ones. Okay, it basically in practice, that just means that you are, whatever you get during your voluntary contractions and you're initiating those separation vectors and you're trying to transfer them to evoked contractions to identify units during evoked responses, you will probably miss some units. Not all of them will transfer, okay? So how do we do this in practice? This is the entire pipeline. I mean, you can read the paper anyway, but just very briefly what we do in practice. We report a number of different contractions, okay? record signals during a number of different contractions. We then decompose those in a normal way, identify units in a normal way. We then concatenate those contractions and we, what we're after here is then tracking units to identify just the unique units that are represented in a set of those contractions. Effectively, what we're doing, we're trying to build a library of multi-unit filters, okay? Because that's all we're interested in. We're not interested in this particular example about what's happening during voluntary contractions. We just want a library of multi-unit filters, and we then apply those to evoked contractions that you can see here and identify firings during those. I'll just show you an example here. So this is with the magnetic stimulation of the cortex. Um, and what we see when we do such an approach is that if we just look at the surface representation of the evoked potential, so the amplitude that we record from the surface without decomposing, as we are increasing stimulus intensity, evoked potential size increases. And in accordance with that, what we do see as well is that the number of identified motor units also increases with that. Okay. So far, so good. We're able to identify units and we have representative evoked potentials with the units identified. So what you see here is that, uh, I don't know which one's which now, but um, let's go back. So I can show it on this. But um, so in blue here, you have the motor evoked potential as it was recorded on the surface electrode. Okay. On the red, you have a convolved signal generated from the identified firings. Okay, so you spike trigger average the firings, you convolve those into a, an evoked potential that consists solely of the firings that you've identified. And you see a high degree of overlap here, you see a high degree of overlap here. And it, indeed, if you quantify this, the energy that's represented by the identified firings in the signal, it sort of varies between 25 and 35%. This is consistent and similar to what you get in the composition of voluntary signals acquired during voluntary contractions. So in, as I'm sure Alex will tell you on Wednesday, when you are decomposing surface signals, the residual will never be zero, okay? So there are always gonna be units that you will miss. And usually the proportion uh, of, of the signal, the energy that you can identify, or the energy of the signal that's explained by the units that you've identified is sort of around the 30% mark. In some people, some nice participants, a lot more, and in some people, a lot less. What you do see here is that the firings are quite scattered. Okay, so you see that there's quite a dispersion of firings. So when we do the, the reason for that is the things are very highly synchronized. Okay, and these firings here are ordered by the recruitment that was identified with voluntary contraction. Okay. So these units here were recruited first during voluntary contractions at the lowest recruitment threshold, and these had the highest one. So if we were just using latency as an estimator of the recruitment order, we would perhaps conclude that the recruitment order is not your typical one of increasing size. So the typical Hahnemann size principle, where the, the smaller neurons are recruited first and the larger ones later and so on. What we do see here is a quite a high dispersion, but even if we look at the same pair of units, we do see that the, the latencies are not the same. They are seem to be jittering. So these are the same units, 
uh, in response to a different stimulation intensity. Obviously, the stimulation intensity was lower here, a bit higher there. And you can see that they're jittering, okay, relative to here. So the one thing to note here is that we can't use latency to infer the recruitment threshold. The reason for that is that when we have a very highly synchronized situation with a very compressed recruitment range, the so-called detection delays will become a compound, basically. So the, what will happen is that the, a unit that has a higher conduction velocity, which is the one that is recruited later, typically, because it is, belongs to a, a higher threshold unit, will arrive at our detection site earlier. It will effectively overtake the unit that, is, that has a lower conduction velocity. The reason for that is that we are doing everything that's so highly synchronized and everything is so compressed that this comes at, becomes at play. Detection delays do exist also in voluntary contractions, but things are happening much slowly there and they're not such a problem if a problem at all, really. If you're doing a slow increase of force, I don't know, five seconds to a 20% contraction, this will really not be at play. It will not become relevant, okay? So to estimate the recruitment threshold, we can't do it from latency. We can't do it as a function of time effectively. We also can't do it necessarily as a function of force because it's partly because it's the same thing. And also in the case of magnetic stimulation of the cortex, we don't always see a twitch response uh, or a mechanical response. So what we do, what we did basically to demonstrate that the recruitment order is still of increasing size, we effectively calculated the firing probability of a unit relative to its recruitment threshold that was estimated during voluntary contraction. So a unit that had the lowest threshold when we were in performing stimulations of increasing intensity was present throughout, was most commonly present. So the probability of firing of that unit was the highest versus a unit that had the highest recruitment threshold because we needed to, it would only be recruited um, when the synaptic input was sufficient for that. That would only become the case when the evoked potential sizes were large, okay? So what we see is a negative relationship here um, and it's demonstrated also by, by the coefficient value here. So the point of that is that the recruitment order is generally maintained even in evoked potentials. So it's something to be mindful of, particularly if you're going to use recruitment threshold as a covariate when using uh, this technique. You can't do it based off of. Um, you have to estimate it basically during slow voluntary contractions and not rely on latency as a measure of, of or your estimate of recruitment threshold. We have done this previously in H reflex. Um, so we identified firings during an H reflex where the Recruitment order is generally maintained and it's fairly similar situation that we see during evoked responses to magnetic stimulation in the cortex. Um, the approach does, um, is less successful, let's say, at identifying firings during a maximal motor response to so during a maximal end wave, where we're stimulating a peripheral nerve supramaximally. Um, so you see here that in black, where you have the representation um, on the on the surface channel from the convolution of, of the firings that were identified, you see a much smaller proportion of energy explained in the, 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 the signal. The reasons for that are many, um, some of which I don't have time to go into, but we do have biases in our decomposition. So one of the biases is that, as I explained earlier in the first part, is that the um, the decomposition algorithms are biased towards identifying high threshold units. It's also difficult to segment units um, when a lot of them are present in the signal, when the action potentials are overlapping. And all these, when all these issues or biases converge, you, you end up with something like this. What's interesting is that in the case of supramaximal stimulation of the peripheral nerves, so you get something like an M wave or an M max, the recruitment order does seem to be much more random. So here is an example where it would suggest effectively that, that the higher threshold units were recruited first, but it is just one example where we did have a tendency to see is that the recruitment order is much more mixed. Um, it is and certainly it doesn't follow the, the typical size principle. And this has been demonstrated previously, I should say, in the, the, with intramuscular electrodes. Um, so just to sum up this stuff, the, what we can do with this approach, 
principally or physiologically, it allows us to identify the, the mechanism at the level of the motor neural pool that causes either an increase in the bulk potential size or a decrease. So if you do interventions when you're interested in a change in, in the motor bulk potential size after motor learning, for example, you can identify whether that was due to an increase in synchronization, increase in recruitment of additional units of both, for example. Um, it allows you to estimate that non-invasively, obviously, and you can identify a large field of the motor units also most importantly, higher threshold units that are much more difficult to identify with intramuscular electrodes, or at least with typical intramuscular electrodes. And what's important is that fewer stimuli are needed. So previously, when this has been done with intramuscular EMG electrodes, they've had to do a lot of repetition, a lot of stimulations. What we did in our experiments was just a typical recruitment curve with between 8 and 20 stimuli for the intensity of stimulation, just as sort of how it's always been done with surface recordings. Um, what it affords you to do as well is you can track units. So if you had a, um, if you had an intervention, and because you are, you are able to track units effectively from voluntary to evolved contractions after the intervention, you can do the same, track them from from original voluntary contractions uh, if you wanted to, and therefore get a representative evoked potential from the the same units uh, and assess the the evoked potential change from the contribution of the same unit that you've identified. It does have a number of weaknesses, so you are limited to mo identifying mode units that you've identified during voluntary contractions. So there's a number of suggestions in the literature in particular that during evoked responses, you will recruit additional units, sort of what are called phasic units, that aren't recruited necessarily during voluntary contractions of the same um, intensity. And those you will certainly miss here because you are relying on filters being estimated during voluntary contractions. And if you're not seeing something there, you're not seeing it during evoked potentials. And all the limitations of blind source separation algorithms when decomposing um, surface EMG signals still apply here, right? So difficulty in identifying um, motor units of lower threshold because the, the algorithm is biased to high threshold, difficulty in segmenting high threshold units uh, during during very high intensity uh, evoked potentials because of superimposition of action potentials. And obviously you can identify motor units that are further away from recording site. That's always the case. But it does afford you the possibility to identify firings during evoked contractions. Now for the last bit, I'll, I'll focus on rapid isometric contractions. Um, so the first two contractions that you can see here are sort of your typical trapezoidal contractions that most labs in the world are using this technology to typically perform. So you have a, a slow increase in force, a certain plateau or no plateau, and a slow decrease. So in this case, you have a 10% of MVC per second, and that's sort of the firing pattern that you get, something which I demonstrated in the first part of the lecture. Even if you slightly increase the rate of force increase. So these contractions were performed to 80% of maximum voluntary force. Um, and here the, the increase will it will take eight seconds to get up to the target force level. In this case, it'll take two seconds. And you can already see that the pattern, firing pattern is changing. Then if you ask a person to contract as fast and as hard as possible from a resting state to a high force level, in this case reaching at least 80% of maximum force. What you do see is a large number of spikes concentrating in the first part of the contraction. And indeed, the discharge rates are incredibly high, much higher than you can ever reach during these sorts of contractions. Okay. When decomposing those, there's a number of different challenges. Um, the first one is that there is inevitably going to be a change in action potential shape waveform. Um, the reason for that is that even though it's an isometric contraction, when you do go from a resting state to a very high level of contraction, the fibers are still contracting within it. So they're changing length slightly, or the rate of change in length is quite high. And as a result of that, you will have a change in <clears throat> action potential waveform. So this is an example when you look at the first firing waveform, you see it here in blue. And then if you take into account all the other firings, you see something in red. So action potential waveform does change. It resembles the shape, but it's not perfectly the same. Okay. You also have biases, like I explained previously, in superimposition of action potentials because the contraction is performed to very high force levels. 
And that's demonstrated here just with an example. So if we do a contraction, a low level contraction to 20%, and then we go from this contraction into a, a very high rapid contraction of high force levels, if we just decompose that signal, what we'll typically get is just units that are recruited in this region, right? So you see a spike train here. This is what the algorithm was able to detect. It's just a unit that was recruited, the higher threshold unit that was recruited in this region. Okay. So that is this bias towards larger potentials operating. The other thing is then if you want to, so what I did here was I decomposed this section and I applied the filter from this section to that one. And what you see is a complete breakdown of the spike train here. So I'm unable to segment this unit further, okay? I have a lot of cross talk from other units, and this is this superimposition of action potentials at play here. So I do struggle to do that. Generally though, if you do it from a resting state to a high force level, and that's been demonstrated originally by the Santa Del Vecchio, is that, that you do, you are able to get spike trains here. They're likely to be of higher threshold though. So just keep in mind, so low threshold units, you will likely not identify. The important point here is that it's a feed forward contraction. So this will happen, this initial spike will happen if the contraction is truly what we call feed forward. So that means that the action is planned, pre-planned, okay? You need to contract as fast and as hard as possible. If you ask someone to do that, they will pre-plan their action and do it. They can't follow a particular trajectory that would look like this. They would be unable to follow it. No, we near, at least not precisely, it, it, any sh shape or form of the word precisely. They, they would just have to pre-plan it. So whereas here, when we have a pre-planned action, we don't see this initial spike. What we do see in these cases is an entire, in addition to the this increased discharge rate, is a massively compressed recruitment range. So we've just taken those three contractions from here, so this one, that one, and the first one of this one, and I just took the first five of every unit that we identified. And as you can see here, the recruitment rate is quite wide. We have quite a big spread. And that's compression happens even with slightly increasing the rate of force increase. And they're completely compressed when we do it as fast as possible. So I'll be showing you some data. This is data from, from my lab in the last, reported in the last three years by a number of PhD students working with a number of different populations. So we've so far recorded 224 sessions with these contractions of 197 unique people. Um, and everyone did sort of five to seven contractions as rapidly as possible. And you can see that there's a lot of variability in, in force production. And this has been reported previously, but that, this is just to make you appreciate. These are ensembles for each individual that we've recorded. Um, and for all of them, we decompose the signals, we quantify the discharge rate, and we quantify the metrics that allow us to estimate the rate of force development. So we can do that in two ways. We can do it with a fixed time epoch. So in this case, I just selected the first 100 milliseconds, or we can do it with variable time epoch where we effectively calculate the maximum slope. So we effectively transform, we do a first derivative between force onset and first sample and force onset and second sample and so on. We get this vector here and the maximum point of that vector is the maximum slope that we can obtain. Um, just before I move on to some results of, of this analysis, one thing to note is that if you, uh, like, like I said previously, detection delays are a problem. And if you looked at the recruitment order based on this, these are the same units that are tracked, I should say, and you have a certain recruitment order obtained from the first contraction, and you can see that that report, recruitment order becomes com a complete mess, basically. You're unable to follow it. And if you just looked at this, and if you weren't aware of detection delays, you would wrongly conclude that the recruitment order is altered in such contractions. The reality is it probably isn't. It's this, it's detection delays. At least we can't estimate it from that. In order to assert that the recruitment order is altered during such contractions, you would need a lot more evidence, in my opinion, than just this. You also can estimate the recruitment threshold in a normal way as a function of force, because, because of the compression of the recruitment range, all the units are recruited, some of them before, because of the neuromechanical delay, before any mechanical action has actually occurred, right? So 
technically, if you estimated it as a function of force, you would think that you've only decomposed or identified low threshold units, which is not the case. In fact, you're more, much more likely to identify high threshold units because of the, the decomposition algorithm bias. So therefore, to, to look at the relationship between discharge rates and recruitment, what you need to do is, so what I did here in this particular example is estimate multi-unit filters here, apply them to these contractions, um, edited the spike trains here, and estimate the recruitment threshold of the same unit from this contraction okay, to get a sensible estimate. And obviously, we get this negative relationship in, in such contractions between discharge rate and recruitment threshold, the typical onion skin phenomenon that I demonstrated at the very beginning of today's lesson. And generally, even though we see a slight flattening of the relationship, we do still see such a behavior during rapid contractions as well. All of this stuff has an implication of one of the things that we try to um, quantify during such contraction, which is the recruitment speed. Recruitment speed is, is basically calculated by sorting the first spikes of each unit by uh, uh, the, the way they were identified, <clears throat> and that's the operative word here. You're sorting them by the order at which they were identified. You then calculate the first derivative of this vector. You average them by the number of units, and you calculate the reciprocal of that, and that's your recruitment speed. And generally, it does have a reasonable correlation to the performance, no matter how you quantify a rate of force development, whether you quantify it with a fixed time epoch or a variable time epoch, you do see a, a reasonable correlation that is predictive of performance during rapid contractions. But the point about this is that you are sorting them by the order at which you identify them, and ultimately how many units you've identified will matter. So if I just selected the first three, I would likely get a slightly different result than if I, if I got all of them. How many we need for a reliable estimate is something we're still working on and trying to understand how many do we need to reliably estimate the, the recruitment speed of units. But we do have evidence from simulations. So this is work done by Jakob Diederiksen in Denmark and, and um, Alessandro Del Vecchio that it's a simulation of a multiple. Uh, so what they have here is a, a, a moat unit that has a recruitment speed um, that is basically, it's a fast recruitment speed. So here it's a recruitment interval with the metric, but that just means fast recruitment speed. But the muscle is actually quite slow in this case and they get a certain level of greater force development. And then on the other hand, they have a very fast muscle, but a recruitment speed that's quite low. And what you can see here when you compare them is that the recruitment speed can counteract effectively a muscle being slow. Okay. So that's another piece of evidence. The recruitment speed is quite important in determining rapid force production performance. What we did with um, Jacob and Alessandro was run another set of simulations where we simulated basically muscles with a different proportion, with a different upper limit of recruitment. So I said in the beginning, hand muscles have a low upper limit of recruitment. They recruit most of their units at a very low percentage of force, um, whereas something like leg muscles will keep recruiting new units up to 100% of maximum. And what we see here is that the rate of force development tends to be greater in units with low upper limit of recruitment. In simple terms, something like a hand muscle will be intrinsically faster than something like a leg muscle. Okay, intrinsically. In absolute terms, obviously not, because leg muscles are much stronger, but in intrinsically, it will generally be, you will be faster with your thumb, for example, or your index finger than you are with your leg muscle. Okay, this is just to demonstrate the importance of recruitment speed uh, as a, as an influencer or as a determinant of rate of force development. The other thing that we might think could influence rate of force development is the discharge rate. And we normally quantify discharge rate in two different ways. We focus on the initial period where the discharge rate is incredibly high and on the plateau period where discharge rate seems to follow this spike frequency adaptation like behavior. Um, and if we look at the initial discharge rate, it has a reasonable predictive power of rate of force development, whereas this one here on the plateau seems to bear no association with how fast we can produce force. Okay? So the multiple generally, if we insert a very high rate of synaptic input, can return force levels that, that are 
um, high and at high rates, it gets there fast, basically, at high rates of force development. What we wanted to look at as well was this behavior that we see, how common that is. So we have that very high spike activity followed by a, a decrease in discharge rate. And that we just use simple hierarchical clustering here uh, to look at what, what the most typical behavior is. And even though we do have some slight outliers here with very high discharge rates, they tend to demonstrate only about 25% of cases. About 75% of cases are these type of behaviors, where we have a moderate increase in discharge rate in the beginning, followed by a decrease to sort of stable level at um, sort of within 200 or 300 milliseconds. And in some cases, this initial discharge rate is actually not that large. So the reason I'm demonstrating this, if, if you're doing this and you're decomposing the signals, the, when you're cleaning your spike trains, it's not necessarily that straightforward. And you need to be quite honest with yourself about what is a real firing and what it isn't, particularly in the beginning of the contraction. And my point is not to be looking for a particular pattern when you are either cleaning your spike trains, okay? Because the patterns do vary. And in, in some cases, you will see a very modest increase in discharge rate in the beginning. So I wanted to understand here is whether that extent to which this discharge rate decreases has any bearing on the performance. Um, so <clears throat> this calculation has been done previously um, by Alessandro Del Vecchio, but did it on a larger sample here is, is basically calculating the ratio between the initial discharge rate and the one at the plateau. And obviously, we did demonstrate quite a, a reasonable relationship, somewhat similar to what the discharge rate would show. And indeed, if you look at the correlation between this uh, initial discharge rate and this index, you, you see a near perfect correlation. The point of that is that most motor units, when they're firing initially very highly, then basically converge to a discharge rate at roughly the same level. Okay. So the, the main thing that determines this index is how high it was discharging in the beginning. That unit will not necessarily then maintain as high a discharge during the plateau region, okay? So this sort of explains that the plateau in the plateau region has no bearing on the performance of rapid contraction and the initial discharge rate has a high degree of, of influence on the performance itself. Just very quickly, one thing to, to appreciate is that in this initial period here that we see, we, we have a very, compressed recruitment range, and most a lot of the units will be actually recruited before the mechanical action will take place. So this will happen in the absence of any appreciable afferent feedback. So this region here that seems to determine most of the performance will reflect the transformation of inputs from supraspinal centers onto, um, onto the motor neuron. And we were interested what that input would be. So the typical sort of thinking would be that it's a corticospinal input because that's the most predominant one in humans. But th there's tracks beyond the corticospinal one that, that seem to influence force production. So this is a data from, from a macaque monkey, which demonstrates that particular spinal cells in the brainstem seem to scale their firing rate proportional to the, the force that they're producing or the load that they're lifting. Conversely, the pyramidal tract neurons or the, your corticospinal tract neurons seem to have a more non-homogeneous response when you're increasing force levels as you're lifting greater loads. And in other species, reticular, reticular neurons or a system similar to reticular neurons is quite, um, it's very much used when tuning fast force production. So it's, it's been shown to be relevant in locomotion speed in mice and in certain species of fish, um, the, this reticular formation type neurons are involved in escape movement where we need to produce force very, in a very fast manner. So what we did was we basically um, delivered a number of different stimuli or performed contraction response to different stimuli. So the, the basic condition was the visual response, then it was a visual auditory response, and then finally it was a visual startling response. So that's a very high sound of about 110 decibels that's been shown to activate particular formation neurons. And indeed, if you look at here, so particular formation neurons in response to a startling stimulus will increase their firing rate 
Conversely, the pyramidal tract neurons will decrease their firing rate. And similar stuff happens in humans. If you stimulate cortical regions, you will see a suppression of the response. Whereas if you stimulate subcortical regions, you will see a facilitation of the response. So it gives us evidence that this startling stimulus paradigm is a way for us to uh, basically target a region that's relatively inaccessible in humans because it's located in the brainstem. We can't stimulate it directly. And if we look at the results of this experiment, we see that the rate of force development increases only in conditions of a startling stimulus. And indeed, the discharge rate of the neurons also increases only in conditions when the startling stimulus is present. So it gives us some evidence that this transformation of input into mechanical action during rapid contractions has a subcortical contribution. We just look at very quickly at different populations. So in older individuals, what we do tend to see that in addition to reduced force production, we also have a reduced rate of force development. And that might be quite important because the ability to produce force rapidly will be probably much more relevant if you're trying to prevent falls, for example, um, than it would be how high your force is in absolute. And what we do see that this seems to be largely underpinned by differences in discharge rate, both in the initial uh, section, uh, the initial region of the, uh, the discharge pattern, and at, at the plateau as well. Uh, although, as we saw previously, this likely doesn't have any predictive power to the performance. We did not see any difference in recruitment speed in this population. Um, but as I said previously, recruitment speed is probably has certain problems um, in terms of how we estimate it. Similarly, if I return previously on this uh, data set from resistance trained, untrained, and endurance trained individuals from one of my other students, what we do see is that resistance trained individuals do, are not intrinsically faster. So they are tend to be stronger, but they're not intrinsically faster. Okay. And what you can see here is despite this subtle difference in discharge rate, we're not able to transform that into any performance. The reason for this might be that the difference in discharge rate required to influence rapid force production needs to be quite high, right? So the difference between the groups needs to be quite high. And relatively speaking, the difference between resistance trained and untrained is not as big as the difference between young and old that we see. So just to round this up, what you get is very high discharge rates in the beginning if you perform rapid contractions, very compressed recruitment range, in the period where afferent input is unlikely to influence that with an input that likely originates from, in addition to cortical spinal, also to reticular spinal one. The important point is that with such contractions, we can estimate, at least in isometric settings, maximal human in vivo motor neuron output. So particularly because my sort of first degree is actually in sports science and a lot of People from sports science say, oh, yeah, but you're not actually able to decompose. Maximal contractions are not very well. So how representative is that of maximal force? My point is that if you want to get the, to maximum motor neuron output in vivo, you do rapid contractions. And that's demonstrated here. So I have actually, in this case, decomposed maximal contractions. And these are just rapid contractions as shown previously. So the instruction here is produce as fast force as fast and as hard as possible. Here, they're not restricted to how fast they need to produce force. Um, they, they just need to go as hard as possible. And indeed, they reach higher forces in this case. And if we look at this initial discharge rate, it's much higher during rapid force production because the rate of force increase is much higher as well. On the plateau region, there will be a slight difference here because they are producing, in absolute terms, greater force levels here. And there's some data from one of my students as well that demonstrates this, so at different angles in this case. But this discharge rate that we see here is very similar to this one. Okay, so these are just classic ramp contractions for 70%, and these are just maximal force. The other thing to keep in mind is that during maximal contractions, you'll be less likely to able to estimate recruitment thresholds. Therefore, you won't be necessarily able to use them as the covariate in your model. And also, when we're performing slow ramp contractions, such as this one, we're usually using an instantaneous or close to instantaneous maximal value to set the target level here. So at 70%, if you've ever performed a slow ramp contraction, it basically feels like a quasi-maximal contraction anyway. So being stuck up on 
able to decompose maximal forces or maximal efforts, there's some challenges with that in how, what is this actually telling you? So with that, I'll just very quickly thank all my collaborators because there are very many actually, and, and a lot of students. And just as a shameless plug, we've recently acquired a grant uh, with Greg Pearce and Simona Brion, who was until recently in Dario's lab, but is now moving to Nantes in France. So we'll be uh, hiring a PhD and a postdoc. They will be originally based in Canada, but um, there'll be a lot of travel involved with this. So if there's anyone interested, do get in touch with us. But otherwise, that's it from me.